Okay, so then I, I guess we'll get going. If anyone has been reading uh, ahead on the lecture slides, it, it is worth noting I, I had to rearrange some material this year, so what's lecture two this year is not what was lecture two last year, so just watch as the things are updated. But what I want to talk about today is some concepts that really cut across the entire first half of this course related to fundamentals of statistics. So statistics is a really important area if you want to understand working with data, working with biological data and the other kinds of data. And of course what we can do here is not going to be remotely equivalent to a full statistics class, but it's what we have a, a, available that I think will get us the essential concepts we'll need to start understanding how to work with the tools available to us later in the term. And what I want to do is start with a motivating example that hopefully will be reasonably familiar to all or most of you, and that is fruit fly genetics, so Drosophila. So Drosophila is a popular model organism. If you end up working in a lab here, there's a decent chance you'll be working with Drosophila. And one of the reasons Drosophila are, are interesting is they're a very tractable organism genetically and have lots of interesting genetically controllable phenotypes. And one of the things you might notice is that some Drosophila have red eyes and some Drosophila have white eyes. And what I'm going to do here is try to use this example where we can cover some of the concepts of statistics that we'll be needing throughout the, the first half of the term. So a common thing we might want to do with Drosophila is conduct a mating experiment where maybe we take an inbred strain of flies that have red eyes and an inbred strain that have white eyes and what we would want to do then is cross those strains and see what we get. And maybe it turns out that what we get are a set of progeny, all of which have red eyes. We would call these the F1 progeny. And if we see this, the common thing we might do is then take one of those F1 progeny and cross that back with one of the purebred white-eyed flies and see what comes out of that. And maybe what we see is something like the following here, where we have roughly half red-eyed flies and half white-eyed flies in the F2 generation. And what we would like to do is understand what's going on genetically that might produce this set of phenotypes. So can anyone suggest a hypothesis? What might be the genetics of the red eye and white eye traits? Well, this kind of pattern, you'll see more of this for those of you who haven't taken genetics yet when you get to a genetics class. When we see a pattern like this, where the F1 generation looks entirely like one of the parents, and the F2 is about half one parent uh, in phenotype, half the other, that often would suggest a simple Mendelian dominant trait. So we would suggest that there are two alleles of potentially a single gene that controls eye color. You would have a dominant allele, which we would represent by a capital R. So the inbred red eye fly would have two capital R alleles. And we would have a recessive little r allele. And we would propose that the inbred white eye fly has two little r alleles, which produces the white phenotype. In the F1 generation, every fly gets a big r allele from the red eye parent and a little r allele from the white eye parent. And so we get all heterozygotes, a mixture of big and little alleles. And we would propose if uh, red eyes were a simple Mendelian dominant trait, that all of those would have red eyes. If we then cross back these heterozygotes with the little r homozygote, so a, a fly that has two copies of the little r trait, then we would expect that all of the F2 progeny would get one recessive little r allele from the white eyed parent and have a 50-50 chance of getting either the dominant or the recessive allele from the red-eyed parent. And so we would see that half our flies would be, uh, well, they would have red eyes, they would have the dominant capital R allele and the recessive little r allele, and half of them would have two recessive little r alleles and have white eyes. So that would probably be the most plausible hypothesis for, for explaining the hypothetical data I've showed you. So does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about this? OK, so that would be a hypothesis. But what we're interested in here is how we would test a hypothesis like this, how we could convince ourselves that the data is actually strongly supportive, or at least not contradictory of that hypothesis. Because there might be other ways, other kinds of genetic patterns that could give qualitatively similar results to what we've seen. So for example, we might have two codominant so a gene R and a gene S, 
and maybe if the fly has the dominant allele of either the R or the S gene, it has red eyes. That would produce a similar sort of pattern to what we saw in the, uh, the first cross. We get all red-eyed flies. And in the second cross, we get some red, some white. We have different distributions of them on average, but we would see something sort of similar. And we might be interested in trying to figure out if the evidence is actually strongly consistent with the simple Mendelian dominant hypothesis. So we might propose this alternative hypothesis would tend to produce more than half of the flies in the F2 generation having red eyes. And maybe we look at our evidence and we see that indeed more than half of the flies in the F2 generation do have red eyes. So maybe we looked at just two flies in the F2 generation and we saw that both had red eyes. Would that be something that would convince us that the simple Mendelian dominant hypothesis was wrong? Well, no, we would probably say that if we looked at just two flies and they both had red eyes, there's a pretty high probability that just by random chance, we would see two red-eyed flies out of two, even if the simple Mendelian dominant hypothesis were correct. What about if we looked at 10 flies in the F2 generation and eight of them had red eyes? Is that enough of a skew relative to the expected 50-50 that we would think we have convincing evidence? Right, so there also, there's a pretty reasonable chance that you would see eight out of 10 with red eyes, even if there was actually a 50-50 chance that each fly independently had red eyes. So that's probably not convincing evidence. What about if we looked at 1,000 flies and 600 of them had red eyes, would that be convincing proof that this isn't a simple Mendelian dominant trait? Yes, yeah, so actually in that case, that would be convincing proof. That would be very strong statistical evidence. But that's not something that's necessarily obvious to see just from looking at the numbers. And what I really want to go through today is how to be rigorous about that kind of question so that we can really say that this is convincing evidence that the hypothesis is wrong and these are not. And that's really what statistics is about, what we're going to be covering today, and what we'll be revisiting in many different contexts throughout the term. So any questions about this yet? All right, so to understand how to do this, we need to know about statistical reasoning. So how do you think about a, a hypothesis or about data statistically? And statistical reasoning, I think, is not actually a very complicated concept. There are a few basic elements of it. And these elements come up in different guises and different problems. But if you understand these basic elements, you understand statistics. So a statistic always has a null hypothesis. And a null hypothesis is something we are trying to disprove. So in our example here, our null hypothesis is that we're looking at a simple Mendelian dominant trait. And that's going to have certain implications for the underlying probabilities of seeing different kinds of events. But that would be our null hypothesis. And in statistics, you're always trying to disprove a null hypothesis. A statistical reasoning example will always include an experiment. So there is some experiment we conduct to gather data that we're going to try to use to disprove the null hypothesis. And then we will have a statistic. A statistic is a number. It's a way of quantifying the outcome of the experiment. And depending on the value of that number, we can determine whether the data is plausibly consistent with the null hypothesis or not. Finally, we will have an assignment of significance to the statistic. And significance is the way we decide if that statistic value is plausibly consistent with the data. It's a way of asserting how unlikely the statistic value would be if the null hypothesis were true. And I'll go through this in much more detail over the next slides as we walk through how this might show up in our example. But basically, this is statistical reasoning. And I'm hoping that by the end of this class, all of you will understand these basic concepts and get how to apply them to a problem like this and later in the term to other examples. So any questions yet? All right, so to move on, to understand these things, we do need some basics of probability, some basic concepts. And I'll try to go through the ones you need. I know that for those of you who are biology undergrads, at least, you are all getting at least some probability in your first year mathematics classes. And most of you uh, in, in other majors, I expect, have seen at least some probability somewhere, maybe not a whole class. So hopefully this is review for a lot of you. But I'll try to give you the essential concepts we need to understand the material today. So one aspect of probability that we need to know about is the notion of an outcome. 
So in a experiment, a probabilistic or statistical experiment, an outcome simply means the things that might happen. So if we are looking at flies in our F2 generation, maybe we look at two flies, that might be an experiment. Then one possible outcome is the first fly has red eyes and the second fly has white eyes. That would be an example of an outcome of an experiment. The sample space then is the set of all possible outcomes. So in this case of looking at two flies, the possible outcomes are they're both white-eyed, or the first is red-eyed, the second white-eyed, or the first is white-eyed, the second red-eyed, or they're both red-eyed. That is the set of possible outcomes, and so it defines the sample space for this particular experiment if we're looking at two flies. We then define subsets of the sample space as events. So any group of zero or more of these possible outcomes is an event in the sample space. And we would often use an event as a shorthand to refer to some subset of the sample space. So two flies have red eyes as an example of an event. In particular, it's the event consisting of exactly the one outcome of two red-eyed flies. But an event can correspond to multiple outcomes. So one possible event is an even number of flies have red eyes. And that would be the event corresponding to two of the outcomes from the sample space. Can anyone tell me which two outcomes correspond to that event? Well, that would be the union of the outcome both flies have white eyes and the outcome both flies have red eyes. So zero flies have red eyes or two flies have red eyes would make up the event that an even number of flies have red eyes. So are these definitions clear to everyone? All right, so the next thing we need to reason about probabilities are actual probabilities, which would generally be encoded in what's called a probability density function. So an assignment of actual uh, probabilities to outcomes from our sample space. So for example, under our null hypothesis, we would believe that we have a simple Mendelian dominant trait. And in the F2 generation, each fly independently has a 50-50 chance, or one half chance, of having red eyes and one half chance of having white eyes. And if we look at two flies independently, then the probability the first one has white eyes is one half. The probability the second one has white eyes is one half. And the probability of a union of two independent uh, events would be the product of those probabilities, one half times one half or one quarter. So the probability of the outcome white white is one quarter. Likewise, the probability of the outcome white-red is one quarter. There's a 50% chance the first one has white eyes, 50% chance the, first one, the second one has red eyes, and likewise for the other outcomes. In this case, under our null hypothesis, each outcome would have equal probability. We would then be able to assign probabilities to events, and the probability of an event is simply the sum of the probabilities of the outcomes assigned to it. So the probability that an even number of flies have red eyes is the sum of the probability of the outcome zero flies have red eyes and the outcome two flies have red eyes. That is, you know, is 0.25 plus 0.25 or 0.5. So any questions about this? Right, so the next concept we're going to need, which is really important for understanding statistics, is the concept of a random variable. So a random variable is simply a way of assigning numbers to our outcomes. And an example of this might be the random variable x, which we will define to be 0 if we have no red-eyed flies and 1 if we have at least one red-eyed fly. So in other words, x is the random variable that assigns 0 to the outcome white-white, and it assigns 1 to the outcome white-red, 1 to the outcome red-white, and 1 to the outcome red-red. That would be one example of a random variable. But anything that assigns numbers to the outcomes is an acceptable random variable. So we could have the random variable y, which is the square of the number of red-eyed flies. So that assigns 0 to the outcome white-white, assigns 1 to the outcomes white-red or red-white. What does that assign to the outcome red-red? 4. So that would be another acceptable random variable. For most of today, we'll be particularly interested in this random variable I'm calling z, which is simply the number of red-eyed flies. So 0 for the outcome white-white, 1 for the outcome white-red or red-white, and 2 for the outcome red-red. 
So that random variable is going to be particularly important to us. And whatever random variable we use, if we've assigned probabilities through a density function to our outcomes, we can assign probabilities to the possible values of our random variable. So for example, if we take the random variable x, we can say the probability x is 0 is equal to the probability of the set of events that correspond to x equals 0. There's one such event. It has probability 0.25. So we can say the probability x is 0 is 0.25. And likewise, the probability x is 1 is the sum of the probabilities of the outcomes that give you x equals 1. So either white-red, red-white, or red-red all correspond to x equals 1. And so we get a probability x equals 1 is 0.75. So that would be the probability density for that random variable for this experiment. So uh, any questions at this point? All right, so we can move on then. And that brings us back to our elements of statistical reasoning. So, the first element I mentioned is a null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is a belief about the data that we are trying to disprove. And our choice of null hypothesis is going to guide the experiment we design. It's going to guide the statistic we design. We need to design an experiment and pick a statistic that will be good at disproving the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis fails in ways we would expect it to fail. So we might, for this example, say that our null hypothesis is that red eyes is a simple Mendelian dominant trait. And that's hiding a lot of complexity within this statement here. So that's making certain assertions about the probability of, of each fly being red eyed in the F2 generation. But basically, we can use that as a shorthand for our null hypothesis. And then we can start reasoning about how we might try to disprove that. So we're going to want a statistical experiment. And a statistical experiment, then, is going to be something that we can use to evaluate the null hypothesis in terms of possible outcomes of the experiment, and something we want to choose so that the null hypothesis will predict how the outcome of the experiment behaves. So if the null hypothesis is true, we understand how the experiment behaves. And the experiment will behave differently if the null hypothesis is false, at least in ways we expect it might be false. So in this case, we believe that it might be the case that we're looking at a co-dominant trait. Let's say we would expect to see more red-eyed flies in the F2 generation for the co-dominant trait. So we might want to design our experiment so that we are going to see that kind of distinction. So if the hypothesis fails in the way we think it might fail, we will see a, a different behavior in the experiment. And so we can more or less do the experiment that I already described earlier. We can cross in red, red-eyed, and white-eyed flies. We can cross back the uh, red-eyed progeny with the inbred white-eyed flies. And then we can observe the eye color of some number n of the progeny. And we'll, we'll see later how it matters what n is. But let's just say n is a variable for now. We'll decide later how many flies we're looking at. And that then is our statistical experiment. What we would then want to do is come up with a statistic. Statistic is usually summarizing. You're taking often a lot of data, and you have to compress that to a single number for each experiment. But it's at least giving us a way of quantifying the experiment such that we're choosing it in a way that it will tend to have different values if the null hypothesis is true versus if the null hypothesis is false. And the key reason we needed that probability theory is the statistic can be thought of as a random variable. And in particular, under the null hypothesis, we can say how the statistic should behave and what the probability density of that random variable would be. And that's what we're going to use to try to figure out if the value of the statistic we actually see is implausible under the null hypothesis. So we know how it should behave under the null hypothesis. We actually do the experiment and get a value. And we can ask, is that a value that we would plausibly see if the null hypothesis were true? Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So here we will use as our statistic the random variable I mentioned before, the number of red-eyed flies out of the n example. So our, num our set of possible outcomes is larger than the set of possible values of the statistic. 
but this is a statistic that we would expect to discriminate between the possibility that we have a simple Mendelian dominant trait and the possibility that, let's say, we have a co-dominant trait. We would expect Z to take on a different distribution of values under those assumptions, but we'll use the simple dominant trait as our null hypothesis and try to show that the value of Z we actually see is implausibly large for that null hypothesis. All right, so that then brings us back to our experiment. So we're imagining that we've done our experiment, we've got a null hypothesis that tells us what the outcome should be, and in particular tells us that each fly we see in the F2 generation, independently with probability 0.5, should have red eyes or white eyes. And that's telling us how our statistic is going to behave if the null hypothesis is true. And we can then start talking about what the null hypothesis tells us the statistic should be doing. So this is showing an example of what this probability density of the statistic under the null hypothesis might look like if we picked n equals 1. So if we looked at just a single fly in the F2 generation. So in that case, we might have our probability density function here, and we have our statistic z. And if we're just looking at one fly, so n equals 1, there are only two possible values z can take on. Either z is 0 or z is 1. So z equals 0 would correspond to the outcome that the fly we observe has white eyes, which we're assuming means that it has two uh, recessive white eye alleles. And z equals 1 would correspond to the outcome that that one fly we looked at has red eyes, which we're assuming occurs if we get a dominant and a recessive allele. So each of these, we would assume under our null hypothesis, occurs with probability 1 half. And so we're going to get probability 1 half z equals 0, probability 1 half z equals 1. So any questions about that? All right, so let's move then to a harder example. We know how the null hypothesis should behave if we look at just one fly, or how the statistic should behave under the null hypothesis. Let's suppose we look at two flies. We could do the same kind of analysis. We could say if we look at two flies, either zero have red eyes, one has red eyes, or two have red eyes. The probability that zero have red eyes is the probability of the outcome that both flies have white eyes. We're assuming each fly has white eyes with probability one half. So the probability both have white eyes is one half times one half, or one fourth. So the probability z equals zero under the null hypothesis would be one fourth. To get z equals 1, we would have to consider multiple possible outcomes that might give the same statistic value. So there are two outcomes that would give us one red-eyed fly. So either the first is red-eyed, which we assume occurs with probability 1 half times 1 half, or the second is red-eyed, the first is white-eyed, which also occurs with probability 1 half times 1 half. So we get 1 half times 1 half plus 1 half times 1 half, which is 1 quarter plus 1 quarter or 1 half. So the probability z equals 1 under the null hypothesis is 1 half. z equals 2 would be symmetric to z equals 0. There's one outcome. Both flies have red eyes. It has probability 1 fourth. So the probability z equals 2 would be 1 fourth. Uh, any questions? Right, so we could go through the same kind of reasoning and do this by hand for somewhat harder examples. So maybe we'll move to n equals 5 flies. We could walk through and figure out exactly what the probabilities should be for each possible statistic value for 5 flies. If we have 5 flies, then between 0 and 5 of them would have red eyes. Probability 0 would have red eyes is the probability or probability each one independently has white eyes, which is one half times one half times one half times one half times one half. In other words, one half to the fifth, which is one thirty second. It gets a little messier to ask the probability one fly has white eyes. We know that each outcome in this experiment has independently probability one half to the power of the number of flies we look at, so one thirty second. So really what we have is the number of outcomes corresponding to z equals 1 divided by 32. So how many outcomes would correspond to z equals 1? Yeah, there would be five outcomes. Either the first fly has red eyes and the rest have white eyes, or the second has red eyes and the rest have white eyes, and so forth. So the probability z equals 1 is 5. 
gets a little messier for z equals 2. I'll just tell you that that will come out to 10 possible outcomes. We get 10, 30 seconds. And then the other cases are symmetric, 10, 30 seconds, 5, 30 seconds, 1, 30 seconds. But generally, we're not going to want to work this out by hand. We're not going to want to have to go through this manually for uh, harder examples. And usually, if we were really doing, a, doing an experiment like this, we would need to look at a lot more than five plots. So this is where it kind of becomes important to know a bit more about statistics than I can give you in one lecture in this class this term. In particular, if you know something about probability and statistics, and if you had a real class there, you would probably recognize that the uh, statistic I'm talking about here is a very particular kind of random variable called a binomial random variable. And if you know that that's a binomial random variable, you know that there are binomial random variables defined for any number of trials. So the trials would correspond to how many flies we look at, and any probability of each outcome in each trial could correspond to the probability the fly has red or white eyes. We could change n and we could change p to whatever value we want. And there's a standard formula we get from the binomial theorem that tells us what those probabilities should be. So this is something I'm just saying for you guys here today. I know some of you have probably had a probability class and know this formula or seen this before. Some may not have. So in this class, we have a lot of other things to cover. I can't give you much more depth on the probability than this, aside from seeing some examples of it. But I do strongly recommend that any of you take an actual statistics class and learn this stuff in more depth. Any kind of scientific research you're going to be doing, you really need to know your statistics, and you need to know it at a greater level of depth than you're covering, so you would be able to recognize when you're looking at a binomial random variable or other kinds of random variables. And uh, we'll have other applications that we'll be seeing later. But basically, that's just something I'll say as an aside right now. I'll try to cover what we need for this class and with respect to statistics, but I would strongly recommend to all of you you actually take a statistics class before you leave here. But that's just an aside. And if we knew that, then we would be able to go to 10 flies or 100 or 1,000 and get the form of these probability density functions. And that's what we're going to need to move further with our statistical reasoning. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so we can move on then. What we next want to do is evaluate our hypothesis. So we want to imagine that we've done this experiment, we've counted our flies, we've looked at n flies, we've got, or we've got some number z of these flies have red eyes, and we are trying to figure out if the value of z we actually observe is implausible under the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is giving us a probability distribution of values or probability density of values we might observe, and what we want to do is figure out if the value we have actually observed has a reasonable chance of occurring under that density. And the way we would commonly measure that is by what's called a p-value. So a p-value is simply the probability the statistic we actually observed, it, or the probability under the null hypothesis that the statistic would be at least as extreme as the value we actually observed. So in this case, we might believe that the statistic could fail because it's a co-dominant trait and that the statistic might be larger than one half. And in that case, what we would want to ask is, is the value we actually see skewed to be too large by an amount that is implausible under the null hypothesis? So let's take a concrete example. Let's suppose we've looked at 10 flies and we've determined that nine of those 10 flies have red eyes. We want to know, is that strong evidence that this is not a simple Mendelian dominant trait? Well, the way we would do that is to go to our probability density and ask, what is the probability that the statistic would be at least that extreme if the null hypothesis were true? So the value we're saying we've observed is 9. And we can look at this and we can ask, what is the probability under the null hypothesis the value would be at least 9? That's equivalent to the probability it's exactly 9 or the probability it's exactly 10. The probability it's exactly 9 we can get from the binomial theorem. It's 10 over 1024. The probability it's exactly 10 would be 1 over 1024. So in other words, 
the p-value for that statistic value, z equals 9, would be 11 over 1024. That's the thing we're going to use to decide if this is an implausibly large value of z. So we can put the math in there, we can get out that our p-value is 0.0011 or 1.1%. As a general rule, what we would say is that a small p-value is strong evidence that the null hypothesis is wrong. The smaller the p-value is, the less likely it is you would see that statistic by random chance. So a really small p-value is convincing evidence that your null hypothesis is not correct. Different fields have different standards for what really small means. A very common one you'll see in experimental sciences is 0.01. So if your p-value is below 0.01, you say it's a significant result and your null hypothesis is wrong. If it's larger than 0.01, you say you have not disproved your null hypothesis. It's important to note that not disproving it is not the same thing as proving it, but you have not disproved it. So in this case, would we say that this is a significant result? Well, here we would say this is not a significant result because it's larger than 0.01. We have 1.1%. 1% or 0.01 is a, a typical cutoff for significance. So this is larger than that. So we would say this is not significant. So seeing 9 out of 10 red eye flies is not convincing evidence that this is not a simple Mendelian number. What if we had seen 20 flies and, or is there a question? Um, wasn't the part of the p value values not converted into this Yeah, so the question whether we refer to it as just a probability or a percentage, there's no standard there. People will often convert speedily back and forth between those. So just be aware of 1.1% is the same thing as 0.001. So on the board, the p-value is at the bottom probabilities and at the top is uh, that a percentage? Uh, yeah, so these are probabilities. This is a percentage. Okay. Thank you. How does all this work with like significant figures? Because the P-value is to two significant digits, or I guess three technically, but then that one is in a percentage, so there's the two, so like, uh, how does that work with rounding? Because, yeah, well, well, significant figures are, are, are something you, you would always want to pay attention to in this kind of a analysis, so that would generally come from your precision of measuring the statistic. But uh, generally, you're cut off. You really know one significant figure, so it doesn't matter how much you need to round. It would be pretty unusual to have a cutoff that isn't something like 1% or 5% or 0.1%. So generally, you, you don't need to pay too much attention to significant figures. You can just round down to one significant figure. Is there another question? OK. so. Let's take this example here instead. Let's suppose that, or excuse me, let's suppose we had looked at twice as many flies. We had seen that when we look at 10 flies, 9 out of 10 or 90% is not a significant result. But let's say we had looked at 20 flies and we had seen the same magnitude of effect, so the same fraction of them had red eyes. So in other words, we looked at 20 and 18 out of the 20 had red eyes. And we want to ask, is that a significant effect? Is that a significant result? Well, we could go through our binomial theorem. That would tell us exactly what these probabilities would be. We could plug into that formula for each of the possible outcomes, or each of the possible statistic values, at least as extreme as 18. That would be adding the probability z is 18, or 19, or 20. And we could come out with a value here, a probability 0.00201. So would that be significant? Yeah, so that would be something we would consider a strongly significant result. So if we look at 10 flies and 90% of them have red eyes, that's not convincing evidence and all hypothesis is wrong. If we look at 20 flies and 90% of them have red eyes, that is convincing evidence that our null hypothesis is wrong. So that's a, a general lesson for statistics that will be important when we start thinking about how to use these concepts in experimental design. As a general rule, for any given magnitude of effect, like the fraction of flies that have red eyes, 
the more data points you look at or the more evidence you gather, the more significant your result is going to be. So often that's a very easy way to get a, a stronger result if you're not sure about your significance, just look at more data points. It's not always practical, but it's something to be aware of. Any questions about that? All right, so there are a few complications that come up in statistics that I'll just mention now, and some of these will come up later in the term. I think what we've covered so far, if you've understood what we've talked about to this point, you really understand the fundamentals of statistics. But a few of these details are things we also need to be aware of. And one of them has to do with the subtlety in how I define the p-value. So I defined the p-value in terms of the probability under the null hypothesis that the statistic would be at least as extreme as the value we actually observe. And the subtlety there has to do with the definition of the word extreme. Because extreme can mean different things depending on how we're trying to interpret our experiments. I was proposing in the earlier example that we expected that this might fail in a particular direction. So in other words, that we might have more red-eyed flies than we expect under the simple Mendelian dominant hypothesis. And if that was the case, then we would be looking at the probability that the statistic under the null hypothesis, I'll refer to that as Z0, is at least as large as the value we observe. But sometimes we don't know what direction of skew we're expecting. So we might expect that on average half the flies have red eyes, but we don't know why this might fail. Maybe it fails in a direction that gives us too many red-eyed flies. Maybe it fails in a direction that gives us too few red-eyed flies. And if that's the case, then you need to consider that the statistic can be implausible in both directions. It could be implausible by being too large, or it could be implausible by being too small. And to handle that, we use what's called a two-sided p-value which basically means that instead of just considering values at least as large as the one we observe, we consider values at least as large and also values that are at least as skewed in the opposite direction. What I mean by that, we can illustrate by looking at the probability density. So the one-sided p-value, we would say that the p-value of z equals 9, we get by considering the probability z is 9 or 10, it's at least as large as 9. For a two-sided p-value, we also have to consider the probability it is skewed by at least as much as 9 in the opposite direction. So 9 is 5 above the mean for this probability density. So we would also consider things that are at least 4 below the mean. So in other words, you would consider that z might be 1 or 0. So in this case, what that's going to do is give us a p-value that instead of being 11 over 1024 is 22 over 1024. So this density happens to be symmetric about the mean, so the two-sided p-value has twice the value of the one-sided p-value for this statistic. That's not always going to be true, but it will always be true that the two-sided p-value is at least as large as the one-sided p-value for any given statistic. So is a larger p-value more or less significant? It's less significant. We want small p-values to show us that we have a significant result, so a large p-value makes it harder to show that the null hypothesis is wrong. So as a general rule, if you know what direction of skew you're expecting, a one-sided p-value will make it easier to detect an effect, but if you don't know, you have to use a two-sided p-value, and then There's one other really important complication that will come up when we start getting into sequence analysis, and then again in several later contexts, and that has to do with the question of what's called multiple hypothesis correction. So if we do our experiment once, we can look at a p-value, and a small p-value will tell us that our null hypothesis is false. But let's say we're looking at lots of equivalent experiments. So maybe we have many strains of red-eyed flies, and we think maybe some of these are red-eyed for a simple Mendelian dominant reason, some of them are red-eyed for a different reason. And we want to know which ones can we show are not simple Mendelian dominant. So maybe we do that same experiment many different times. We see p-values in each of those cases, so for each strain of red eye fly. And every so often we find one that is below our significance threshold. So if we had done just this one experiment, we would say this is convincing evidence 
that this particular strain of red-eyed fly does not have red eyes for a simple Mendelian dominant reason. But if we do this experiment a hundred times or a thousand times, this is actually not convincing evidence anymore. So the p-value is the probability that we would see this particular statistic by random chance in one trial of this, in one run of this experiment. But something that occurs rarely is going to occur if you do the experiment enough times. If you do the experiment a hundred times, you expect one of those times something is going to occur that happens with probability one in a hundred or less. And so if we did this 200 times, we would say we would expect one of those 200 times to have a p-value below 0.005. So this is not convincing evidence if we've done this kind of test many times. And this is something we have to be careful of because many of the kinds of analyses we'll be doing, we will be effectively running many similar experiments and trying to figure out whether any one of those is significant. We have to control for the fact that we have run these many similar experiments. <coughs> there are different ways that's done. I'll introduce one of these now that will be coming up when we look at uh, sequence searching. There are other ways this is done that we'll mention later in the term. But the particular way I will talk about is something called an e-value. So an e-value is basically a way of taking our p-value and getting a corrected equivalent to a p-value that adjusts for the fact that we have done the test many times. In particular, it's adjusting to tell us how many false positives we would get at a particular p-value threshold. So if we do the experiment and we get a statistic value, and we see that the value of that statistic in one particular experiment is 0.001, then what we would want to do is ask, if we had set our cutoff at 0.001 for all of those experiments, how many false positives would we get? So just by random chance, how many of those would show up as significant even though the null hypothesis is actually true? And the e-value is a way of doing that by finding the expected number of things across all of our experiments that would have at least a p-value at least that small. So let's say we looked at a hundred strains of red-eyed flies, and in one of those strains we found a p-value of 0.01, so something we think is at the threshold of significance. As long as our number of trials and our p-value are not too large, the e-value is approximately the number of trials or experiments times the p-value. So in other words, if you do a hundred experiments and you have a p-value cutoff of 0.01, you expect by random chance that about one of those experiments will show up as significant even if it really isn't. So that is the e-value corresponding to that p-value. And if you're doing multiple experiments or you're doing a kind of computational analysis that involves running many similar statistical tests, usually you're going to want to look at the e-value rather than the p-value. So in particular, if you want to be sure you're not seeing a false positive result, you want the e-value to be significantly lower than 1. So you might want to look at e-values below 0.01 instead of p-values below 0.01. That's something we'll see again, as I say, when we get to looking at sequence searching and alignment, and then it will come up later in the term. And there are other ways of doing this that we'll see in other contexts, because different fields tend to do this different ways. But this is an important point to be aware of, and another way we will often use statistics and experimental design, because the more experiments we do, the more strongly we need to correct for multiple hypotheses. So the more experiments you do, or the more things you look at, the harder it is to get a significant result. So another way we will often try to use our understanding of statistics to improve experimental design is to avoid doing extraneous experiments or find ways of designing our experiments so that we are not using so many hypotheses. And that will make it easier to find deeper effects in our experiments. Are there any questions about any of that? Okay, so a lot of this I need to talk about this more or less in the abstract at the beginning of the term, so we know about this when it comes up later. I think these concepts will become clearer as we actually use them in practical analyses in the subsequent weeks. All right, so a brief review of what we've seen. We have seen essentially today elements of statistical hypothesis. We've seen that statistical reasoning involves formulating a null hypothesis, something we're trying to disprove. 
We've seen that it involves developing a statistical, a statistic and a statistical experiment to go with it that will allow us to discriminate between the null hypothesis and likely alternative hypotheses. We've seen how to evaluate p-values, or also to correct these to get e-values, to look at the significance. We've seen how to use that to reject the null hypothesis. And again, I'll just stress the point that failing to reject a null hypothesis is not the same thing as proving the null hypothesis. It might be the null hypothesis is actually wrong, but we didn't have enough data points, or we didn't design the experiment well, or we chose a poor statistic. Often, when you fail to disprove your null hypothesis, you might actually want to go back and redesign your experiment to see if you can come up with a stronger set of evidence and maybe end up rejecting it, even though the first experiment failed to reject it. So one last thing I want to re-emphasize before we break for today is that I really think all of you guys should be taking a statistics class. If it were up to me, that would be a requirement for your degree, but uh, you know, a lot of other things I, I know you guys need to take. But whether you're a computational biologist or an experimental biologist or any other kind of scientist, this is really important material to know. So the fundamentals of statistics, I think, are pretty simple. If you've understood the material today, you understand the fundamentals of statistics. But there are a lot of details, and the details are actually kind of important if you want to use statistics effectively. So we saw one example of that when we had looked at the binomial probability density or the binomial random variable. So there are a lot of examples of these kinds of standard random variables that come up again and again when we do different kinds of analyses. And taking a real class on this is going to let you recognize these. This is really a general theme of mathematical modeling and computational work that the same mathematical abstractions will come up again and again in different contexts. And if you know how to recognize these and know how to work with them, you'll be much more effective in using these. There are likewise a lot of general purpose statistics that will come up again and again in different guises. So for example, there's something called the chi-square statistic. We'll be seeing that in multiple different biological contexts because it happens to be a particularly good statistic for working with certain kinds of mathematical abstractions that come up in many different experimental contexts. Likewise, we'll be seeing something called the t-test in a couple of different guises, something called MANOVA, you know, that we may be seeing in z-score. There are lots of these that, again, come up over and over again in any kind of experimental data analysis. And these are things you learn to recognize and work with and be much more effective in your experimental work if you know about these. Finally, there's a lot more advanced material I don't have time to even talk about here that you would learn that helps you in designing your own statistics evaluating p-values, working with particularly difficult or complicated probability distributions. So this advanced material can really make you a much more effective experimental scientist. So all of this is why I think you guys would benefit from knowing more about this than I have time to teach you. But for the, the moment, I think what we've covered today should get you through this class. So before we break, are there any remaining questions about the material we've covered today? Gracias.